All right, we're moving on to Beth Dumont from the Jackson Laboratory. Beth uh, grew up in the outskirts of Augusta in a large French-Canadian family. Her curiosity in the natural world was cultivated by a childhood spent playing in the Maine woods and her family's commitment to self-sustainability through gardening, beekeeping, fishing, and hunting. After graduating from Coney High School, she pursued her BA degree in biology and anthropology at Cornell University and then completed her PhD in genetics at the University of Wisconsin. Beth is currently an assistant professor at the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor. Her in research interests lie at the intersection of evolutionary biology, genomics, and statistical genetics. Beth's research group harnesses the power of the house mouse model system to understand how the molecular processes that generate genetic variation vary among individuals. In her spare time, because all these guys have tons of spare time, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Beth enjoys hiking and biking with her family on MDI. She is also an avid long distance runner. Um, and when I asked Beth for kind of a little tidbit on how she got her interest in, in science, she actually referred back to her childhood. And she said growing up in rural Maine helped her get a passion for exploring. Um, so that is um, just actually just inspiring. It's gonna, I'm going to use that when I go on a hike with my kids and convince them it's time. So. Okay, so thank you. Um, uh, so as an evolutionary biologist, I've always been um, really fascinated by the, the scope of, of variation in organismal form and function that we see in the natural world. And of course we know that much of this variation reflects uh, differences in how various organisms have uh, evolved mechanisms to cope with some of the inherent challenges that they face in their day-to-day -day environments. Uh, challenges like how to find food, um, how to find the food they need to, to fuel their cells, uh, how to find mates so that they can reproduce and, and maintain their species, uh, and also challenges like how to avoid predators. Um, and studying um, this, this inherent diversity among organisms is important because not only does it broaden our general appreciation for biodiversity, but what I really want to communicate today is that by studying the diversity inherent in our natural world, we also stand to advance our understanding of human disease, uh, and potentially shed light on new approaches for treating uh, and, and, and potentially even curing uh, various human uh, uh, diseases. And so in order to um, kind of uh, highlight uh, this central thesis here, what I plan to do is kind of just go through a couple of examples um, that I think provide great little case studies uh, to support this, this argument. And so the first is uh, this guy here. This is the naked mole rat. Uh, and one of the really cool things about this particular species is that they don't get cancer. Um, so somehow, uh, this critter, um, through some accident uh, of evolution, has sort of already converged on the holy grail of modern medicine, right? Which is to develop a strategy that enables them to completely prevent cancer. So recent molecular and uh, biochemical work has shown that the cells of the naked mole rat uh, secrete high levels of this particular uh, high molecular weight sugar. It has a name, and I can never remember it, nor can I pronounce it, so we'll just abbreviate it at that. Um, but uh, this particular compound uh, serves to kind of communicate to cells in the neighborhood uh, and prevent them from overcrowding and prevent them from forming tumors. So imagine that we had some way that we could harness this sort of endogenous mechanism that's already at work in the cells of the naked mole rat and put that mechanism to work in our own cells. If we could do that, I think that would set us on the path to potentially developing really effective preventative approaches uh, for, for keeping cancer at bay. This is another really amazing creature. This is the um, uh, African spiny mouse. Um, and this animal has amazing regenerative capabilities. So if it gets wounded, it can completely regenerate its skin. It can completely regenerate hair, even sweat glands, uh, all the way down to cartilage. Uh, and it can do this without even leaving a single trace of a scar. So that's pretty amazing. Some recent studies have also shown that the spiny rat can also regenerate heart tissue. So if you uh, induce a heart attack in one of these animals uh, in the laboratory environment, uh, it has the ability to completely regenerate new cardiac tissue. So by understanding how this amazing little critter accomplishes these uh, really outstanding biological feats, uh, I think we could potentially stand to develop new approaches for treating wounds in humans, uh, as well as enabling victims of heart attacks uh, to completely recover. 
And this uh, adorable little fuzzball here is uh, the Mogollon vole, Microtus mogollonensis. And this has actually been an organism that some of my prior work has focused on. So uh, in order for most organisms to reproduce, they need to first uh, uh, produce sperm and egg that carry exactly half the amount of genetic material as other cells in the body. Uh, that way, when sperm and egg fuse, the resulting zygote carries uh, exactly one copy of the genome, no more and no less. And the inability to do this, the inability to make sperm and egg that carry precisely half the amount of DNA as other cells in the body, is a major um, mechanism of infertility in humans, a major contributor to human infertility. So um, one way that this process can go awry, um, this process of, of having the genome, one way this can go awry is if chromosomes uh, fail to partner up uh, and identify a partner during the earliest stages of, of, of sperm and egg formation. And this is demonstrated here in a picture that's not coming up very well in the slides at the moment. Now, in most uh, animals, if uh, chromosomes fail to pair with one another uh, during these early stages of oocyte and sperm uh, formation, and this includes uh, humans, uh, uh, this will arrest the formation of sperm and egg. Now, for some reason, a reason that we don't yet fully understand, in the Mogollon vole, there's always a set of chromosomes that never pair. And yet... Do humans secrete that sugar that the naked mole secretes? And if not, where else is it found? Yeah, so humans do secrete that sugar, um, but it's at a, a, a much lower concentration than what's seen in the naked mole rats. Yeah. What effect does this have on that bowl? Yeah, so... <laughs> um, I don't know, you can't leave me in, you know, <laughs> So, um, yeah, like I was saying, in, in, most, um, in most mammalian species, uh, chromosomes need to find a partner within, in, within the genome, partner up, um, and the failure to do so acts as a trigger, a cellular level trigger that will arrest the formation of sperm and egg. Um, now in voles, uh, some of my prior work has shown that there's always some chromosomes that fail to pair. And yet nonetheless, in voles, uh, these animals are fertile. Uh, they produce huge quantities of sperm um, that carry you know, the precise half genome complement that we'd expect them to. So um, somehow voles manage to break the, the standard rules, um, yet still they go on to uh, produce uh, viable sperm. And so if we had some way to kind of unlock whatever mechanisms are at play in voles that allow them to escape this, this sort of normal uh, uh, checkpoint that arrests the formation of sperm um, that could potentially guide us towards uh, therapeutics for treating infertility in humans. So why did you pick voles over the cancer people or the, like what, what got you to voles? What got me to voles? Um, so <laughs> a long, long story actually, <laughs> one that I can't distill in three minutes, but um, no, so for, during my PhD, um, I had this great ambition that I was going to uh, go out and actually trap some wild mice for an experiment I was doing. And my mission was to trap wild house mice. Um, my, my PhD was in Wisconsin. We did this in this old growth prairie. Um, and we didn't find any house mice. All we managed to trap were voles. So I sort of stumbled into <laughs> studying voles by virtue of the fact that they were the only critters who showed up in my traps. Um, <laughs> But one of the things I did when I brought those animals back into the lab was I put, them, I put their cells under the microscope and I started looking at their chromosomes. And in particular, I started looking at how their chromosomes behaved during the process of sperm and egg formation. And that's how I sort of accidentally stumbled across this really cool finding where one set of chromosomes, notably the sex chromosomes, never actually engage in this pairing association that we know to be so important um, um, in other uh, uh, mammalian systems. So, Africa doesn't seem to be overrun by this magic critter that manages to fix everything. So, presumably, he hasn't solved all the problems. Sure. So, it seemed like it was pretty magic. So, why aren't there, why isn't the forest or wherever they live, I didn't get where they live. The you're Over talking about the spiny mice? Yeah, or the, the little spiny guy, yep. the cute little gray guy up yep. there. Why aren't there millions of them running around if they can fix everything? <laughs> So, I mean, if they do get eaten. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, 
that's probably, that's probably one of the major things keeping the population in check. Um, once you're in the gut being digested by another organism, you don't stand much of a chance regardless of your regenerative potential. Um, so I, I think that, that's, that, that may very well explain it. Um, and they also, you know, they don't have complete regenerative ability. Um, there's a cap to it. So I think, I think uh, you know, I think they can, if, if they incur a wound that affects about 60% of their skin, I think they can recover from that. But much more than that, they, they, can't, they can't handle that, that, that burden. How close are you or other scientists to actually finding viable medical treatments from these animals? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I can speak about the voles because that's the system that I've worked in and I can say we are very, very far. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think the real advantage here is that, you know, this, this allows us to see that there are organisms out there in nature um, that have already solved some of the same problems that in our own species we grapple with and that consistently manifest as disease. Um, and so I think there's just, uh, uh, you know, real power to kind of turning to nature um, and studying the solutions that various organisms have already developed uh, in, in nature to, to address problems that affect us.